Hi, everyone. I'm Abby Wolf. I'm the executive director here. It's, thank you for making your way over here on this icky day. And we're, I know the people who are in this building are very happy that <laughs> we are located here today. So special thanks to Professor Marcelino Morgan for opening the Hip Hop Archive to us today. Um, we're here to hear the third of Hortense Spiller's fabulous Du Bois lectures that um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing the recording or the vi seeing the video of the first one because I missed it, but I know yesterday's was fantastic, so I'm very, very thought-provoking. Um, so we look forward to the third. Right now, I will introduce you to Professor Marcelina Morgan, who I just mentioned, um, Professor of African and African American Studies here at Harvard and the founding director of this amazing space that we're in the Hip Hop Archi Archive and Research Institute. So please welcome Professor Morgan, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Abby. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure uh, to not only introduce Hortense Spiller, but having her here on this occasion at the uh, archive um, is really um, makes us feel as though we're working um, to bring so many arguments and issues together, especially around feminism is you know, one of the projects we're working on, which hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about today. Um, I hope this isn't your last. For those of you, it's your first time. I hope it isn't your last. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. Um, an esteemed literary scholar and culture historian, Hortense Spiller is the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Professor of English at Vanderbilt University. And um, on the last of the series of lectures, I, we always like to go through some of the um, accomplishments of the speaker because in the midst of the discussions, very often some things are mentioned that some of us may have missed in the interim. And um, I want to read some of that today to remind us of why we've been having such a wonderful uh, um, discussion and presentation and time um, talking about some of the ideas and issues and theories and important uh, points that have been made by Professor Spillers. Her, her two previous lectures, Revolution, Sentiment, and Sorrow, and the Problem of Sentiment, the Hemings, Hemings the Hemings of Monticello, <laughs> um, have enlightened and challenged us in a very intellectual and emotional way through her discussion and analysis of slavery and overall how we understand the world when we also recognize that black women and all the baggage that have been handed to us and, us and some of that we carry on our own are very much in it and of it. The last lecture will be on women and the laws. Uh, Professor Spillers earned her doctorate in English at Brandeis, and yesterday she talked a bit about being at Brandeis, and her BA at the University of uh, Memphis. Uh, previous to joining the faculty at Vanderbilt, she held positions at Haverford College, Wellesley College, Emory, Nebraska, and Cornell. Uh, she also has been visiting professor in literature at Duke and at the Kennedy Center for North American Studies at the Free University in Berlin. During the course of her distinguished career, Hortense Spillers has made immeasurable contributions to the fields of African and African American studies, women and gender studies, as well as literary criticism and from my own particular background, anthropology, uh, cultural anthropology. Furthermore, her scholarly, scholarly work has pioneered interdisciplinary approaches in the humanities by bringing to bear considerations of race, gender, semiotics, colonialism, psychoanalytic theory, and diasporic geographies and histories, not only on the interpretation of literary texts, but also ultimately on understanding of black lives. She's a recipient of many honors and awards. Among them are grants from Rockefeller and Ford, and she's been a fellow at the National Humanities Center Research Tri Triangle and the Center for the Study of the Behavioral Sciences. For nearly three decades, Hortense Spiller's thought and writing have been pivotal uh, across several fields of scholarship. Her recent books include Black, White, and In Color, Essays on American Literature and Culture, and she's edited collections of essays such as Comparative American Identities, Race, Sex, and Nationality in the Modern Text with Marjorie Price. Uh, she's also edited Conjuring Black Women, Fiction and Literary uh, Tradition. 
Her 1987 essay, Mama's Baby, Black's, uh, Papa's Maybe, an American Grammar Book, um, is seen by many as one of the first um, articles that came out that really began to focus on the complexity of not only the black women's experience, but how society, the West, the world, feminists in general, had described it and, and the ways in which um, feminists who were black would redefine it. And I think in many respects it predicted it. Um, her work remains an important example for today. How can we understand what's going on in feminism or something like hip hop f feminism? What, how we're displaying black women's bodies and what they mean without discussing many of the arguments she has made in her work. For example, in my own work as a linguistic anthropologist, I remember when I first became disturbed with the notion of the term baby, baby's daddy um, because it recentered the focus on the baby as opposed to the parents of the child. I wondered, does it reinforce bonds? Does it break them? How much the social welfare system was involved in focusing on the baby and not the parents, the economics of fraternity rather than the importance of family, and the drop of the possessive baby's daddy to baby daddy as a description of the parent as opposed to the mother. What did we give up? What was achieved as a result of all that? Through her work, there's also the fundamental notion um, of family, love, respect for culture, and a real drive. And as someone who works for hip hop, very much um, um, interested in someone writing in the 80s who had this drive for this notion of hip hop, it's called realness. And realness is not a state, it is the pursuit of figuring out what's going on, what can be done, how do we actually deal with, reflect, change. Her work also shows, well, it is evident that love as well as expediency serve as the foundation for everyday heroism black men and women have displayed in their relationships with each other. African American women and men have engaged in creative and complex kinship and gender dynamics without which it would have been difficult if not impossible for them to survive. Um, in 2007, what you're gonna do revisiting, um, um, there was a panel, um, what you're gonna do revisiting Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American Grammar Book. In that, she says, I wrote that because it, through a sense of urgency, with the need to tell something that had been told over and over again. I knew that none of it was new, but what was new was that I was trying to bring the language of a postmodern academy to a very old problem, a problem that historians had been writing about for at least 50 years at the time that I was writing this piece. And so I was trying to ask the question again, ask it anew, as if it had not been asked before because the language of the historian was not telling me what I needed to know, which is what is it like in the interstitial spaces where you fall between everyone who has a name, a category, a sponsor, an agenda, spokespersons, people looking out for them, but you don't have anybody. That's your situation. But I am like the white elephant in the room Though you can't talk about the era of sound in the U.S. without talking about blues and black women. You can't talk about the era of, slaver, era of slavery in America without talking about black women or black men without black women and how that changes the community. There is not a subject <clears throat> that you can speak about in the modern world where you would not have to talk about African women and New World African women. But no one wants to address them. I felt that in 86 and 87, no one wanted to put a theoretical spin on this. I mean, we really are invisible people, and I just kind of went nuts. And I am saying, I am here now, I am doing it now, and you are not going to ignore me. And so all of those essays are saying, I am here now, what you're going to do? I give you Hortense Spiller, Women and the Laws. I really appreciate that. Thank you so very much. 
and thank you very much for coming out on this really miserable afternoon. I was thinking that maybe nobody was coming and I could take a nap. <laughs> Been waiting for days to sleep. <laughs> so I want to I want to talk today about um a story. And it's sort of related to uh, yesterday's topic, women uh, and, and the laws, but I think of this as living the law. And I call it Between Text and Talisman. And it is taken from uh, an article that gives me uh, the story that I'm, that, I'm going to, uh, that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, this story is, is told in the work of Rebecca Scott and Jean Hebrard, H-E-B-R-A-R-D. These are two historians who work together in public law, and um, they wrote a story about an African woman who ended up uh, in Haiti, and they talked uh, uh, in this story about the fate of Rosalie Vincent uh, and her children and her grandchildren. And that's the story that I want to uh, reflect on today in relationship to uh, topics that uh, we've been talking about all week. It is 1867, two years after General Robert E. Lee has surrendered arms to the next iteration of the United States of America. Sometime during late November of that year, Louisiana lawmakers convoked a convention to write a new constitution for the state of Louisiana. On the 4th of December, 1867, the ninth day of the proceedings, one Congressman Edward Tinchon, T-I-N-C-H-A-N-T, -A, a free man of color, takes the floor and proposes that the assembly adopt measures to assure the civil rights of all women, uh, regardless of race, color, or previous condition. In the pursuant debates, he was uh, an active uh, participant. And I just saw an old friend of mine. Hi. <laughs> Scared me there for a minute. <laughs> In pursuant debates, he participated uh, very actively. Debates about uh, the franchise, about other liberties to the people. And in the final days of that convention, uh, he called once again uh, for women's rights. But in addition, he boldly proposed that the conjugal relations of women, those relations not sanctified by marriage, be recognized by the state. And he went on to suggest that the state take juridical measures to ensure that either party in a relationship not sanctified by marriage, and again, regardless of race or color, be granted the ability to more easily bring complaint in cases where the promise of marriage has been broken. And so he wanted he wanted the law to be able, well, he proposed that there be a law to, to force marriage in the case of a relationship that had been continuing uh, over a year. So the Louisiana Constitutional Convention of 1867 and 68 drafted a strong rewrite that guaranteed equal access to schools, public transportation, public accommodations, places of entertainment, although Congressman Tinchon's proposals, as you might imagine, were not adopted. 
nor did the body rule on questions of marriage. Rebecca Scott and Jean Hébrard collaborate to bring to readers and scholars of the historical fields that converge on the age of revolution, the reconstruction of this quite uh, remarkable story that is captured in their study called Freedom Papers, an African Mother and Her Children in the Era of the Haitian Revolution. And that, that's, that's my translation of uh, the piece that is referred to by other historians, among them Laurent Dubois, in his uh, most recent work, Haiti, The Aftershocks of History. That's, that's where I found, um, found the reference and decided to have a look at it because I was interested in what uh, one person has called history from below. Most of the material that um, I have examined for this project so far, and I think that might reflect a lot of the work uh, that, that we do anyway in a, in a cross-disciplinary way, um, presents the era of its study in the broadest sweep of historical time and space, while the magisterial movement that accompanies history and that's history with the capital H, the thrust and parry of battle, both actual and symbolic, offers immense satisfaction. I'm, I'm also riveted by what Frederick Kranz calls history from below, where the other people, let's call them, are located in the world of the everyday. And I believe that it is here in the obscure, half-hidden doings of the non-public or the non-historic world that we often find impulse and impetus to events that provide the headlines of world order. The story that Scott and Ebra reconstruct in their work is precisely an instance of history from below, insofar as its protagonists are not the Jeffersons and the Lovatures and the Christophs, the Christophs and the Dessalines. Dessalineses? <laughs> it could be. <laughs> but the ones whose names, like Congressman uh, Tinchon's grandmother, Rosalie Vincent, are buried in the archives of the world's special collections well beyond the ears and eyes of living memory. The remarkable features of Rosalie Vincent's life from the point of view of an investigator is, first of all, it, it, it is a, a story of unfolding revolution in the French metropolis in um, the French colonial world of the Antilles and the capital cities of the early United States, and she's living those events as her everyday world, right? It's everyday for her. Once enslaved, become the concubine of her master. In other words, when the black Jacobins, as CLR James calls them, set fire to a small town on the southern plain of Saint-Domingue as a strategy to combat the advancing army of General Victor Emmanuel Leclerc, Napoleon's brother-in-law. Rosalie Vincent is sent fleeing like all the other inhabitants of Jeremy. So Rosalie's story vividly inscribes a particular African diasporic instance from the moment of her capture from among the, the Pular nation of, or peoples of West Africa through the Middle Passage, which she experiences, into the New World. In short, Rosalie Vincent lends a name, a face, to the, uh, to the statistical log of the movement of goods, to the workings of law and decree, sitting high 
looking low. The story delineates in considerable detail the relationship between official bureaucratizations, the maneuverings of the law, and the human subject's willful assertion to, of the right to life. A tale that is scored in violence that begins on the west coast of the African continent ends up two generations later on the floor of the Louisiana legislature and beyond, and finally in the hands more than a century after that of English-speaking investigators in disparate settings. In short, Rosalie Vincent's story offers what Brent Edwards calls the practice of diaspora as a paradigm of movement and transformation and transportation across contact zones, uh, we might say, to echo another colleague's work of race and culture. So when Congressman Tinchon proffers what must have seemed to some of his colleagues on the floor of the Louisiana legislature an immodest, if not an outrageous, proposal. He was remembering something that he himself did not experience or witness firsthand, but a story whose details find their way to him, where he was born in France, 1841, from parents fresh from New Orleans, USA, fleeing in 1840, the difficulties of trying to live as free black people in a United States headed for war. According to Scott and Ebrar, the congressman uh, was enrolled at the Lycée in Poe during the revolution of 1848. They track him from Bayarn, from which place he departs in 1857 for Belgium after uh, Napoleon has abolished the Second Republic. He reappears according to their outline in 1862 in New Orleans where he meets up once again with his brother Joseph who has become a cigar merchant. So to these early and intense experiences the authors attribute Tension's lifelong and categorical refusal to accept a hierarchy of races and what he called the tyranny of aristocracy. In his own view or in his own reading of his motivations, he insisted on the role played by his political education in Europe and his participation in uh, the civil war in this country on the Union side. But he also described himself as a son of Africa, of Haitian ancestry. So from the Center of Archives at Aix-en-Provence, Scott and Ebrard discovered documents that allowed them to sketch out the affecting story of Congressman Tenchon's grandmother, who lived the Odyssey from slavery to freedom, sexually mediated by the black woman's abject posture in the 18th century in the racial hierarchy of domination. <clears throat> the uh, dramatis persona of, of Freedom Papers demonstrate the interactions of race, class, and gender situatedness under social and political conditions that we recognize as extreme. But more than anything, their movements across the landscape exactly choreograph the power of decree of the written word to decide human fate. Scott and Ebrard describe Michelle Vinson's handwritten letter of emancipation as a maneuver that falls somewhere between what they call a juridical text and a talisman, which contradistinctive unity aptly captures legal nuance in confrontation with 
uncertainty. Though Rosalie is twice freed, once by decree, then by a letter from her former master, for those who exist in the zone of history from below, reversal is as much a possibility as emancipation. So what the story articulates is what such a gamble looks like when life and death are at stake. The authors first encounter a written trace of Rosalie Vincent in 1799 when she is living on a farm on the southern peninsula of Saint-Domingue in the town of Jeremy. The French metropole has been shaken by revolutionary movement for 10 years already, given colonial impetus by free people of color in the early 1790s. Their representatives had turned up before the General Assembly in 1789, demanding their rights and equal status with their white counterparts. But the social status of the mulatto was often elided with that of free blacks, as we have seen from ordinances of 1773 that we talked a little bit about yesterday that barred them from certain professions. Shanti Singham is the historian that I'm, that I'm quoting from here, uh, points out that uh, mulattoes, for instance, were consigned to segregated companies in the local militia. They were segregated from sitting at table with whites so that there were signs everywhere of their social inferiority and their entrapment between racial fault lines. But simultaneous with their supposed superiority um, over free blacks, they were, they were very often um, themselves landowners and holders of slaves. The appearance of Julian Richmond, or Raymond, I'm sorry, uh, before the General Assembly I suppose we could call that their first uh, attempt to sue for uh, a separate peace. He promises to um, respect property there and reminds the assembly how uh, mulattoes had served uh, in the pursuit of runaway slaves throughout the century uh, and, and, and so forth. In any case, what Singham argues is that these assertions were insufficient to earn the franchise for either mulattoes or free blacks. Shortly after that, Vincent Auger's interventions are met by resistance from white colonists when he attempts to organize a mulatto caucus for elections. He does not succeed and is himself captured in 1790 by colonists, given a mock trial, and brutally lynched. And some of that lynching is described uh, by historians. It's really unspeakable what, uh, what happens to this particular character, who also plays a role in C.L.R. James's Black Jacobins. In any case, O.J.'s treatment sets off a firestorm in 1791, which engenders a change of tactics on the part of mulatto activists who finally interpret the political tea leaves in another way. And that is to say some of them take up arms against uh, white colonists. Uh, some of them seek alignment and coalition with the island's half a million black people by far the largest single population in Saint-Domingue at that time. But these American events are further mediated by international machinations when the British and Spanish, espying an opportunity now to enter a scene of civil war on the side of white colonials who want independence from France. So France has 
one eye on black and mulatto communities and alliance, and another on the growing threat from their British and Spanish neighbors. And in having that astigmatism focused on those two places, they dispatch two rather famous commissioners to Saint-Domingue, Leger Santonax and Etienne Pulverel in the fall of 1792. So acting on behalf of Republican France, the commissioners pursue a couple of aims, and one of them is to figure out the best way to save the colony and preserve its wealth. And they think they can do so by satisfying some of the demands of both free men of color and of blacks. And to circumvent or limit the risks of an invasion by the Spanish, who controlled Santo Domingo, or the Spanish-speaking part, uh, of, of, that, of that island, the, uh, the other half of it. The commissioners also create what is called the Legion of Equality, armed uh, men of color, as well as abolish slavery in the north of the island. And in October 1793, the measure is extended to the south, and that's before the 1794 proclamation. So from that time forward, there is, a, there is officially no more slavery in Saint-Domingue, and as Scott and Ebrar put it, no person can now claim before the law to be the owner of any man or woman. So we are familiar uh, with these events as the historians uh, choreograph them, but they take on added layers of drama for the reader when we can situate actual characters in connection with them. Rosalie Vincent, for instance, is living in Jeremy when British redcoats disembark in the town at the end of September 1793, having been summoned there by the counter-revolutionaries of Jeremy from their location in neighboring Jamaica, where British troops are stationed. So inasmuch as the emancipation decreed by the commissioners uh, will not take place in the south of the isle until a month after the British troops entered the picture, it is safe to assume that the measure is adopted by the French officials as an act of political expedience. I mean, they're not in love with the black people, right? I mean, they're really doing something else. At the end of 1798, following a very complicated uh, military story, the abolition of slavery uh, is formally recognized in Jeremy. Those who had been enslaved were designated in written documents at that time as franchised, as cultivators, and as free Negroes. Scott and Abrar surmise from the archival documents that Rosalie Vinson is in her 20s in the late 1790s, and she continues to live with Michelle Vinson. I just saw another friend of mine, right? <laughs> All these friends of mine I'm seeing, who emigrated to Saint-Domingue from France where he was born. Not among the class of wealthy planters who had amassed considerable fortunes by the end of the 18th century in what has, has been called France's most prosperous colony. Vincent had, had become a small farmer uh, upon moving to uh, Saint-Domingue, had married uh, but lost his wife in 1772. So he comes into possession of a modest coffee plantation um, from in Abrico. And when he moves to the region of Jeremy, he acquires some land and a few slaves. And one of those enslaved is Rosalie. So he, he is a, a small landowner who enters 
into a liaison with Rosalie as the relationship uh, is described. Rosalie and, and Michelle are involved in a kind of semi-conjugal partnership, which implies asymmetrical but reciprocal dependence. And I take that to mean the trade of sexual favors for protection. Uh, these arrangements, and we've talked about this before, were not novel to the French colony. They were not novel. We're learning anywhere in the New World, right? And it's instead of asking the question that 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 uh, one might start with, you know, the the question really reverses: Who was not in one of those? relationship, not who was in one, but who missed it, right? Because it seemed to be happening all over the place. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. Everybody was a concubine, everybody was a white master, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty striking. So it's not, it's not novel uh, that, uh, that this is happening at all. It's a, lot, it's a lot more common. And as I said yesterday, the, the Jefferson Hemings uh, liaison, which still makes some people angry, I found out. I don't know if this is apocryphal. I'll just tell this, this little story. Some people told me a few months ago uh, at Princeton on a tour of Monticello when a, a black tour guide mentioned to some of the people that she had on the tour, when she brought up the Hemings Jefferson liaison, she was smacked oh. by one of the people on 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 the tour. I mean, can you can you imagine that? So this th this idea, you know, still upsets some people. They need to get over it because uh, <laughs> it was it was quite a common thing. And the only reason why it seems rare to us today is Jefferson status, right? the very public man uh, and, and his importance to the un unfolding of New World history. That's why our attention uh, is captivated uh, by, that, uh, by that relationship. In any case, uh, even though these sexual arrangements were common practice, they were generally considered illegitimate, right? I mean, both in uh, the Black Code and in the laws of the Southern states of the United States. So, what they, what what Rosalie and Michelle act out repeats a protocol that seems to be one of the defining threads or thematics of uh, an American order. It seems that Rebecca Scott is a historian of public history. Uh, one of the items in her bibliography uh, is her own study called Public Rights and Private Commerce, an Atlantic Creole Itinerary in Current Anthropology, uh, Volume 48, Number 2, 2007, if somebody is interested in looking that up. Freedom Papers then takes us through the work of bureaucracies and their relationship to our birth, to important ritual moments, our death and burial, and the disposition of our goods posthumously. I mean, for those of us who don't have to worry about things like that anymore, right? Freedom Papers. Uh, this seems a very trivial thing but it was, not, it was not at all trivial in the world 200 years ago. I mean, if you looked like me and didn't have the papers, or in some cases, if you had the papers, you could be returned to slavery. So it was not a trivial matter at all what happened to you before a notary public, for example, and how things get registered and recorded. In, in Rosalie's case, having, having the right papers uh, could mean the difference between 
slavery and freedom. So apparently small pieces of paper mean everything. And many of our writers of fiction have played on, on that uh, thematic. We know what happens, uh, for instance, in the known world. It's just an example. Uh, Edward Jones's work, uh, A Man is Free, and, and it, it doesn't matter. He meets two people who, uh, who remand him uh, to slavery. Uh, the story of um, 12 Years a Slave, what is it that was just made Yeah, in, 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 into a film is another example of that. <clears throat> the first piece of paper then uh, that, that we record, and the other thing, the other thing that, that I, I will note about uh, the birth is that a birth is meaningless until it's social, until it's socialized, right? Until the state recognizes, right, that, that our parents had a baby. Uh, the parents are interested in that, but then it's a, whole, it's a lot of other people who are also interested in that, the state, the census taker, uh, and so forth. So the first piece of paper that we see in, in, in this work, uh, the first one that Scott and Ebra uh, address is the registration of the baptism of Rosalie's little girl. And that's an, th this is an important name to, uh, character's name to remember, Elizabeth. Elizabeth called a natural child. And we know from our studies in Shakespeare that a natural child is a child that is born uh, outside the institution of marriage, right? This child is given the surname Dudoné. Dudoné, God given, right? Elizabeth Dudoné. The act is registered or recorded by the parish priest of uh, the little church in the town. Um, and this particular church at Cap Dom Marie also served the village of Abrico in the region of Jeremy. This document bears the mother's name, Marie Francois, called Rosalie, Negress Free. But also the baby's name with a surname that could never belong to that of any white family of the colony, right? And black people could not share uh, supposedly uh, the last names or the surnames of, of, white, of white families and, and so forth. So Scott sees a problem with the addition of uh, the word free since all the inhabitants of Saint-Domingue have been officially free since 1793-1794, and the year is 1799. Scott thinks that uh, the priest who performed or who recorded uh, the baptism performed a kind of anachronism and that he was doing that uh, as, as proof because the status of a former slave could not be so easily erased from public memory. So he adds free as a way to reinforce the new status. Michelle Vincent signs his name as a witness uh, to the baptism, as appears also uh, Elizabeth's godmother, a Marie Blanche, or a widow Aubert, a free woman of color. There's also a godfather uh, who signs the papers. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we should stop and listen to them, right? So Michelle Vincent in this uh, document uh, acknowledges 
the paternity of the child, but he acknowledges that she is his natural daughter. Napoleonic politics intervene all along, um, excuse me, all along this story. Um, the, uh, the tragic circumstances of uh, Napoleonic um, intervention brings about some of uh, the following. And I had mentioned this a little before. When Napoleon wants to strip the black generals of their power and bring this colony in order, he sends his brother-in-law, uh, Leclerc, on a military uh, expedition uh, to, uh, to the colony. And to make a real long story short, uh, Leclerc's advent uh, is, is bad news for Saint-Domingue. Of course, as we know, he dies later uh, from, from yellow fever. But in the meantime, slavery is, is reintroduced in Martinique and then in Guadeloupe, uh, again in Guyana in 1802. And according to uh, the historians, he was going to uh, restore or reintroduce slavery in, in Saint-Domingue once, uh, uh, once the colony had been brought back uh, to order, or brought back in, in line. Toussaint at this time is, is, is lured by Leclerc under false pretenses into what he thought would be negotiations, but he is instead arrested and sent into, into exile. The reigns of Leclerc and Rochambeau uh, are, are times of uh, considerable atrocities that are variously described by, uh, by historians. So in this, in this turmoil, anything could happen. Scott and Ebrard explained that that's why a letter of manumission is written for Rosalie, and uh, she is to bear this on her person. And that one of the other reasons why he writes the letter is that he himself is thinking about returning uh, to Paris, but he's going to return without her. And so he's going to leave her alone with four children. And so he's thinking about what, what might happen to a young black woman uh, with four children under the circumstances. And so that is another reason why he drafts uh, this letter in 1803. But the plan that he had uh, to return to Europe uh, is foiled. And one of the reasons why that text uh, is foiled um, has to do with this. This is a little story in a story. Uh, a Dominican businessman by the name of Pierre Cazot, who ends up in Philadelphia, supposedly writes from an eyewitness point of view, uh, the, the following set of circumstances of the following event. A French general, Sarazin, who's supposed to take control of the southern peninsula, abandons the plantations in the interior uh, to black, rev uh, black revolutionaries who are burning in, in their wake from the mountains through the interior of, of Saint-Domingue. And so as the combatants and arsonists approach Jeremy, the people flee. And among the people who are fleeing is Rosalie Vincent, two of her children, and uh, Michelle Vincent. It's very vividly described that as the combatants with flaming torches in their hands crash down on the village, the people run with whatever they can take uh, in, in their hands. Some people manage to find boats 
I guess these were some of the original boat people, right? And they end up in Cuba at Santiago, uh, southeast Cuba. While in Cuba, Rosalie registers her freedom papers uh, with the makeshift bureau at Santiago, and it is uh, a request that is said to be fulfilled, at least this is on the document, a request fulfilled um, okay, what am I saying? It is an act that is requested to be fulfilled by the citizen, Marie Francoise called Rosalie Negress residing in this town. Scott calls this letter a double viaticum insofar as it is Michelle Vincent's letter of manumission now countersigned by a, a French officer. So even though these papers are signed uh, by uh, Michelle Vincent, the owner, and by uh, a French officer, one of the children of Michelle uh, Vincent, Marie Louise, uh, is seized in the satisfaction of debt on the death of uh, Michelle Vincent. One of his friends turns up uh, as his executor, somebody to execute his last will and, and, and testament, and one of those daughters is seized uh, in, in, in the fulfillment uh, of debt. At the end of uh, 1808, in the beginning of 1809, Napoleonic, Napoleonic politics again make things difficult um, when the Spanish in Cuba react and people again uh, have to uh, have to flee, and this time from Santiago, the refugees reach New Orleans in more than uh, 30 boats. And some of the people reaching uh, New Orleans uh, claim to be accompanied by their slaves. Now this, of course, is a difficult picture. The year is 1808. The North Americans have abolished the slave trade, which means that you cannot bring or introduce on American soil, at least it means officially, you cannot introduce on American soil enslaved from anywhere else. But Jefferson's mis uh, emissary in New Orleans, a William Claiborne, plays fast and loose uh, with this uh, with this provision, and in effect uh, suspends federal law, so that means that some of those people are re-enslaved when the refugees reach New Orleans uh, from 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 Cuba. One of the people disembarking in New Orleans uh, in the New Orleans harbor is the godmother of Elizabeth. Dudonay, remember her, the God given, and there's a good bit of intrigue uh, going on with this story. And to make a long story short, because I think we're probably running out of time, that daughter marries a Jacques Tinchon in uh, I think it's something like 18, 1822, and that's that's the mother and father of the congressman. Uh, where uh, the talk started. There is one last document uh, that I want to talk about, and I, I, I want to do that briefly. Even though she is um, a married woman and has broken the grip of, would we say, an evil godmother? I mean, there's all of that in the story. And the years have passed. We are somewhere around uh, the 1830s. And she has started having uh, children of her own. The one last thing she wants to do in the way of a regulation is to give herself a surname, right? To lose the Dudonet. 
and the surname that she gives herself is Vincent. And what uh, Scott and Ebrar point out uh, in, in, in their piece, that that is, that is her way of gaining dignity because she has given herself at last uh, a surname. Right. The story doesn't, uh, doesn't stop here. It goes on and on and on and finally uh, comes back to the United States in, in the 1860s, but I think I will, I think I'll stop there. All right, thank you. So thank you so much. Um, we actually had last year, I think Rebecca Scott was here delivering Huggins lectures. So it was very interesting to hear she your gloss. She things? did. She did talk about a lot of it. She talked about the the recovery of the materials and her tracing the path and everything. So it was. So you'd already heard this. Well, we've heard a different version of it. <laughs> it was, but it was good to. I mean, for me to have some familiar names to kind of locate myself in what you were talking about. So I think many people here were, were here for that as well. But um, Q and A. No, good. Okay, so not so only for those of us who attend all the lectures. Well, but it was a, it was a, it's a new it's an endlessly new and fascinating story anyway. So you see what happens when you come to Harvard? They already know everything. No, I didn't. I didn't mean it in that way at all. Not at all. So, but I'm gonna stop talking. I don't want to get into trouble. So please, Q and A questions. Thank you. Um, I was struck by one comment that you made uh, at a point when uh, Paul Verrell uh, emancipated the slaves of South and Saint Domingue, and you say that he was motivated by national security interest that the British had invaded the province, and that he didn't do it because he loved black people. I think were the, the yeah. words that you used. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, both he and Saint Domingue were abolitionists in the French Revolution before they got to Haiti. So. We have to give them credit for a tiny bit of idealism, maybe, in what they did. But it's more the expression they didn't love black people because both of them actually had a woman of color as their partner at the time. So in a very little way, you could say <laughs> they loved <laughs> black people, at least one black woman, uh, because this is after the abolition of slavery. These are two free people. It's a free union. Uh, both women, they eventually married. Uh, so I think it's... Uh, oh, there, the there is a sentimental well, aspect. Uh, <laughs> there's a sentimental <laughs> aspect to it, and yeah. the, where I'm going at with, uh, with it is the extent to which all these unions between men and women of different races that you have described, and you keep saying, well, they pop up everywhere. Yeah. Uh, there might be some politics there uh, that are relevant to the larger politics beyond the bedroom, in the sense that uh, these men who are interacting with women of color on an everyday, every night basis. Uh, what are they getting from it that what might influence their action in the political sphere? And those women of color who might not have the right to vote, who might not be strong actors in the public sphere, uh, is it a way that they are influencing uh, the politics in their daily interactions? That's a good, yeah. that's, that's a good point. Yeah. And it's something that uh, I am struggling with now. And, and it was actually what I plan to try to write about in full, and that is uh, the question of sentiment. And this is, this is what, what I think about that. I think that it is a very complicated question. And I'm not saying for a moment that uh, the men did not love the women and and vice versa. I, I, I suspect that, that some people did uh, love each other, but then also, I, I'm beginning to try to figure out what happens to love in relationship to relative power in the other, right? And I'm beginning to think that you can't, you, you I don't, think you can call that love. I don't think. I think we I think you have to call it something else. You may be able to call it sentiment. Mm -hmm. 
But I'm not sure that you can call it love. I think that love is an infinitely more complicated thing. And I started, at the, the question comes up because in Barbara Chase's novel, Sally Hemings, who was so much younger than Jefferson, I don't know if that was a, was a problem in the world of the, uh, of the 18th century or not, Thomas Jefferson is born in 1743. Sarah Hemings is born in 1773. <laughs> and when I saw that, I went, <laughs> how do you explain that? So he was, he was not only upper class and a leader uh, in, in this society, he was also quite a lot, quite a lot older. And so under those circumstances, I don't, I don't know if the scene where she says in the novel, and I really argued with that scene in my mind, I adored him. I just get up and walk around the room and say, <laughs> you adored him, girl. <laughs> And she decides to stay in Paris. Uh, I'm sorry. She could have stayed in Paris. And she does, in fact, as I remember this from the novel, she does, in fact, run away for two weeks. But she goes, she returns. And it sounds like, from the narrator's point of view, one of the reasons why she returns is that Jefferson is subject to migraine. And that's actually what his biographer is saying, that he could, he could really, he could be very sick with, uh, with migraine headache. And so he gets very ill when uh, Sally Hemings disappears, but she comes back. And in the novel, she returns to Monticello pregnant. She's, 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 she's a very young person. So that's why the whole world, or uh, no, all the, the, the vocabulary around sentiment, love, sexuality, all of that is now for me in crisis because, because of that, right? I also wonder what to do with sentiment in relationship to uh, not just black women, but white women, right? who surrender what uh, Amy Drew Stanley says is their uh, whole being to a man when they marry all their, all their goods, all their things, their being. They metaphysically disappear. Not just legally, they metaphysically go away. And, and you say, yes, but I love her. And so I'm thinking, well, maybe you don't want to be loved, maybe you want yeah, if that's what it means, that I must relinquish and give up in order to be loved. And I think maybe women subjects have done that too long. That if, if this is what it means, then maybe, maybe I need to think about something else. <laughs> I don't need that. If that's what it means. And so that's why I'm in crisis about, about that idea of the, of, of the concubine having private power. Um, because I think that uh, there is so much political manipulation of that idea in our world, right? I mean, every man who messes up politically brings his wife to stand there beside him. The image of moral rectitude. And he asks our forgiveness because his wife is standing there. Well, okay, that's, so that's, I think that's what sentiment allows to happen. The mo motherhood and the appreciation of that comes out of those feelings. Right? I mean, they're power reflexes. 
And you give people something to hang on to that's not about power. It's the, it's the substitution of power with something else, or by something else. And that's what I'm thinking happens very often in those situations where the man has so much more power than, uh, than the woman. So, Yeah. And this has just been fabulous the last three days. Just wonderful, Professor Spillers. I, I, just while you were talking there, I was thinking, what about in your own work and the work of other historians? Um, because you're making these distinctions so readily and powerfully about public and private. What about public and private sentiment? And what about your role as someone trying to bring public sentiment back to, 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 to these people who've, who have been lost or buried. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think of Sally Hem <coughs> Hemings, who's buried under, well, likely buried under a parking lot in Charlottesville, and the Jefferson Cemetery where Hemings' descendants can't even go because they might step on the grass. So. I'm wondering about how you might see sentiment work in a public way with your own project and the work of writers and historians. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge question. <laughs> well, how do I see that how do I see that working? I guess I guess I'm trying to explain um, what kind of world could generate a world that could, okay. What kind of world could generate an order that tolerated slavery and freedom at the same time? I, I'm trying to figure out what that, uh, what that, what that was like, and that's that's why I have uh, really taken up this this project. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking of uh, John Meacham's uh, Art of Power, which is a, what, a very recent biography of Thomas Jefferson, and. He accepts that uh, Jefferson is quite probably the father of Sally Hemings' children. But he says something that uh, makes me, in the end, very sad. Not only was Sally Hemings never herself liberated, but at the end of that, uh, as far as we can tell, she had nothing to give to her children. She had a few keepsakes of Jefferson's. It was an inkwell and a shoe buckle. A shoe buckle? A shoe buckle. And an inkwell. It almost brings tears to my eyes to think of, to think of that. Which is a very different uh, situation from the children, the white children mm -hmm. and the white grandchildren. Right? What did they so, have? Mm -hmm. What did they have? Well, they had they had Monticello, even no, though Jefferson didn't. was greatly indebted. Yeah, right. that had to be had to be sold off. Well, the legacy what? of of Jefferson but they is what they had. Huh? Nothing really to the truth. It's an interesting question. What he left? He left yeah. to the country, but <laughs> I don't want to. No, <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. no Please, it's a go ahead. Thing. No. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying. I'm trying to. Uh, I'm, I'm really trying to get. I guess you could say um, uh, a, a nuance or a feeling tone mm -hmm. for what that was like, so that the 18th century has become for me a kind of interesting place before now, <coughs> uh, or for for me now. Uh, whereas the 19th century before 
but it's, it's really quite the contradictions I think heighten the interest in it. And so that's really what I'm what I'm trying to get at by trying to go through the private. Does it make does it make a difference to who people were in the public world, the kind of private circumstances that, that they had. Does that sort of help? Yeah, thank you. Another good friend of mine, <laughs> Rich Blint. How are you? Hello, how are you? Great. Well, hi. hi. Um, thanks for coming. So my name is Monica, and I'm an intern here. And I guess one thing that I'm still kind of taking away from this discussion is this idea of like a woman in a relationship sort of having to subordinate herself, and how that kind of like gets misperceived as like love and emotion, but in reality it's like power dynamics, sentiment, and the like. And so I guess tying it back into sort of like current experiences and like modern day experiences, how do you feel about this sort of phenomenon of like a ride or die chick? And how that ties into, because it's a real question, how that ties into um, like celebrity personage, just how they keep going back to these relationships and how the cycle kind of gets perpetuated, um, both in the public eye and in the private eye as well. Just a question. Tell me what, what was the name that you, <laughs> what was the name? That you said? So ride or die, like a ride or die chick. R-I-D. Yeah, R-I-D, yeah. Oh, I see. So it's a girl who's... Yeah, I was... <laughs> so a ride or die chick, I guess it's a noun. Um, it's a woman who is just like down to ride or die with her man. So um, he goes to ups and downs, goes to jail, but she's still there. Exactly, yeah. Cheats on her, she's still, the, she's still there, yeah. I just really quickly want to add to that because bringing it into the contemporary sphere, I was thinking Tuesday and today about um, Janae Rice and the things that you were saying about where there is no freedom, can there really be love? Um, and also what you said about uh, what made it remarkable was not the relationship itself, but that we knew who Jefferson was. It seems to me that Ray Rice, you can say the same thing, that domestic violence is common but all of a sudden the, the national attention is on the idea of violence toward this one black woman. And I'm having a hard time remembering when else has that been in the attention of the public sphere. It's, it's, it seems, oh, that's, yes. <laughs> Which is the, yeah, thank you, exactly. So suddenly it, everything old is new again, it seems to me. But. I guess that's the answer uh, that, um, that, that, that I would offer. Um, everything old is, is new again. I mean, I really think we are going back through those, uh, real, those social orders and arrangements that we thought we were done with, right? Um, I think that uh, forms of slavery today suit our time and our circumstance, but they are nevertheless forms of enslavement, right? It reminds me of something that um, Judith Butler argues in uh, The Psychic Life of, of Power, when she talks about um, how the master enters the room with me, it's, I'm not gonna remember the, uh, the, the quote exactly, but it's something like that. What she seems to me that what she's saying is that subjects are constituted by power, that power is not simply something that happens outside oneself, right? Uh, that, that, that power constitutes the subject, or is a part of the constitution of, of the subject. 
so that it seems to me that uh, a lot of what we do today is to uh, choose unfreedom and to do so in freedom's name, right? And we think we're we think we're choosing, but I'm not I'm not so sure that 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 we are choosing at all. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you for this stunning couple of days. Um, I'm really curious about choice and consent. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of stuck on the moment when Sally Hemings leaves Paris and comes back because he has migraines. Um, because because those, those moments appear a lot in the archive of these kind of concubinage relationships. And so, um, you know, she, she said, she, th there, are, there are so many examples. And so I'm just wondering, you've used the word choice a couple of times and choosing unfreedom. Can you just talk a little bit about how you wrap your head around choice or consent in the context of these kinds of power dynamics? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure I can, I can, I can, I can do that, but, um, You want to say more about the question? I feel an answer <laughs> coming, but you want to say more about that? What's your sense? What's your feeling about the whole question of, of, of choice? Well, I mean, I'm incredibly compelled by what you said about love. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the kind of impossibility of love in a context like this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think. I don't think they are. But how do you know you're choosing? It seems to me that's what you're asking me, right? How do you know you're choosing? And I don't. I don't know if I know the answer to that. Uh how you know. I mean, how do you know when um, your act of bad faith really devolves on yourself, that you've betrayed yourself? I mean, do you, how do you really know that? And somehow I think, uh, somehow I think you know. I mean, I think that in that in some ways we blind ourselves to uh what is true about these things i think that's what happens with uh, racism in our world right that 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 racism is a way to get at something else that you really don't want to name and so racism is a is a way to displace it. You can call it this problem, or you can give it this name, but it really is about it really is about oneself, or about something else. And I, I think that I think that happens in so many different ways that we're always displacing, right? And in, and sometimes hiding. Uh, from what's really going on. I think we probably always know what's true. And we don't we don't we don't always act on it because I think Baldwin said somewhere in uh, the fire next time that uh that to act is is to be in danger. And so acting on what we understand um, on the most intimate level, I think, is as dangerous as acting in the political world because it means that you've got to make some decisions that's going to be different from the stuff you're doing now. And that's, that's always quite difficult. So I think, we, I think we do know, and I think it's probably... Uh, the highest moral task to try to be true to what we have already articulated and what we already understand 
about the choices that we're making. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your inspiring talks. And I think I would like to come back to the bigger terms we've been discussing, freedom, love, sentiment. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering how one can, and I think my question is a methodological question, how one can actually, to some degree, resist this presentist uh, uh, perspective to go back, and you, you're not doing that, I'm not saying that, but uh, to go back to the late 18th century, early 19th century, and talk about love and power relationships too much from our perspective mm -hmm. uh, of today, because of course, love relationships have always been power relationships and they keep on being power relationships because mm -hmm. in hardly any relationship you have two partners that are of equal power. But of course, mm -hmm. it is also, uh, of course, not, n not very productive to, to sort of uh, collapse the, the, the economy of slavery with our present condition of course yes. uh, nobody would want to do that but the, mm -hmm. the question that it, uh, that that is very important for me would be to to th how to can we think back to love relationships at that time mm -hmm. uh, how how do you do that from yeah. the reading of text how is sentiment actually and and of course sentiment is is a big term for the 18th century right it has been discussed over and over again um, so how we can we actually grapple with these issues that are so central, obviously, to these kinds of very specific mm -hmm. situations uh, that play out politically mm -hmm. uh, in, mm -hmm. a, in, a very, in a very, I think, um, uh, important way. But how can we actually get at that? And how would you do that? I, I, that's why I think it's a methodological question. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, don't think we get very far when we think, you know, when we compare it to particular situations today, even though, of course, power relationship. And the, the term of the subject you brought up, I think, is very important. Subjectivity mm -hmm. was something very different from what it is now, as mm -hmm. it is being discussed mm -hmm. in, in Butler. So mm -hmm. so I just wonder uh, how, yes. how you grapple with that I, methodologically. With yes, yes, yes. Well, you know what? Actually, I have decided that... Um, it's not a struggle I'm going to win, <laughs> right? I have decided that, uh, okay, I am, I am situated uh, where I'm situated with a certain kind of sensibility. I will do the best I can to respect terrain that is not my own. And once I've done that, that really is all I can do, right? Is to look at this this ground that 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 I wish to respect uh, because it's 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 not it's not me. That uh, once once I do that, um, I think if. What's going to happen? I think that the reading that I bring to it from my own perspective is going to give it a certain color. Well, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and certain, but so what I'm after, knowing that that's going to be the case, is to go for the most poignant and, 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 and the most effective reading that, that I can get from circumstances of severe limitation, right? That I am limited in time and, 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 and space, right? And so I think that um, the question of methodology, we never really win profoundly, right? That on, that on the deepest level, we don't, we don't win it. That we that we go in with the tools that that we have. I am devoted to, uh, as far as I can tell, interdisciplinary tools. I was a uh, history major in college and an English minor, and then I switched it. 
and I switched it because I thought all the white professors were trying to drive students out of English. And I thought, oh, that's bullshit. <laughs> let, me just, let me just go on in here. <laughs> Make some A's in these books. <laughs> At the University of Memphis, which I did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I switched it and became an English major and a history minor. Uh, but I have, I have always loved those fields together, and so I try to bring those, those, those two perspectives uh, to, to whatever work that, that I do, and then try to appreciate uh, the ground that I'm, that I'm going on to. But I think that the, that, that other thing, we probably, we don't, we don't ever, it's always an interpretive act, right? that we're playing out. Hi, yes, uh, my, my question is uh, about the theory of the violence of the law uh, and modern economy um, that you've been developing over the last uh, three brilliant days. That's um, founded not upon freedom, but upon slavery. And specifically in, in relation to the talk today, uh, you mentioned an opposition between uh, the maneuvers of the law and the right to life, or the half-hidden doings of the non-public. Um, and I wanted to talk about that relationship between those maneuvers and the, those, those doings and that life. Um, I think about the context where I work in South Africa, um, and you know, liberation movements in South Africa, uh, which were made up of uh, lawyers and outlaws and prisoners, um, you know, staged in all sorts of ways interventions into the law um, at courts, outside the streets uh, of courtrooms, um, using papers of, of some of the kind that you mentioned um, in in ways that. Uh, didn't necessarily reinscribe that violence of the law, but attempted to um, do something else with it. Um, and in addition to that, uh, these movements thinking very much about uh, the law above the law, uh, a revolutionary law, um, a, a law that extended beyond um, what was uh, sort of confined to the, uh, the violence of the modern. Um, so that's my question. Wow. Hmm. You know, when I think about um, maneuverings of the law, I think about uh, how unprotected ordinary people are. I mean, that's really what what I have in mind when I when I talk about that. Uh, ordinary people are uh, really powerless before the law, so that. I feel ambiguous about about the law or ambivalent about uh, about the law. <clears throat> I am, as I think of myself, a law abiding person. <laughs> my, my people would be disappointed if I were something else other than law abiding, right? Mm -hmm. But at the but at the same time, I th think that there is an aspect of law or a, a, a dimension of law that uh, we're always trying to humanize because it seems to me that it loses sight of, of the human. And that's what I was talking about yesterday when I look at the majority that sits on the U.S. Supreme Court now. I mean, I look at those gentlemen and, and I wonder about them. Like what's, what, what's up with them? Where does a law like this come from? Do they live in the same world that, no. that we live in, right? And so, you know, you wonder about uh, people who are privileged, uh, people who uh, have security guards around them and fences and dogs and people with guns and so forth. I mean, they don't, they don't know how the rest of us live out here and the implications of what they do. So that from that point of view, uh, there is an aspect of law that is 
asocial, if not inhuman, so that we are constantly talking about the humanization of law. And how, you, how, how, how do you get the law uh, to see a uh, human subject on the other end of it? So that manipulations or maneuverings uh, of law, really, when you think about it, uh, makes you tremble right? for people who don't have some weapons to fight with. Literacy, understanding, a little money, something to fight back with. Right? And that's why incarceration rates in our society are so awful because the subject on the other end of that is mostly somebody who is helpless before the law. So, you know, you read that law and it's, um, it's, it's, it's inhuman very often that knows how to genuflect to the empowered. And that, that happens, it happens all the time. So that's one of the reasons why this, this subject um, has been so striking for me for a long time in, in trying to imagine what the life of my great-great-grandmother uh, was, great-great-grandfather was somewhere early in the 19th century, before mm -hmm. slavery ends, right? I mean, they have, they have nothing to bring to of the laws that can at any moment be taken into the hands of power and abused by power. So it seems to me that, 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 that it is our work, I mean, those of us who see things a certain kind of way, uh, to work at uh, the humanization of the human nation of the laws, the socialization of the laws. You know? Please. Thank you so much. I'm thinking of the pieces of paper and I'm thinking of the movement and I'm, and I'm still not convinced I asked you on Tuesday about French law. It's not, I'm not convinced that we can say without reservation that either it covers her fully or that she understands that it covers her fully. And so is it possible that given what we know about patronage, given those pieces of paper, that she's weighing the uncertainty of France and the surety of something bad, but the surety of something in the US, and that that's what happens. That that's, that's why she makes that choice, which is not a choice that we don't like, but, but, it's, but it's something known. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, and I'm, this is when yeah. she, you mean the... This is Sally the, Hemings. Yes, but, yeah. oh, okay, when she comes back. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Solomon Lance, whose uh, edition of the Black Code I, I, I uh, talked about yesterday, talks a little bit about um, what life was like for free blacks in France at this time and they were not having fun. You know, it was not a great, it was not a great thing. I mean, they were on the periphery of that society. If I understood what he was saying there correctly. Yes? I think one last question and then we'll, yeah. I'm going to, if I had a button, I would button my jacket. I <laughs> yeah. does at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can put your shawl around. That's right. You need the shawl. To go <laughs> I do. I'm a little chilly right now. <laughs> yeah. Getting back to what you said about the law and the getting back to what you said about the law and the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, I'm just back from a conference of many people like myself who've taken, in one sense the law into our own hands mm -hmm. and said what's going on is wrong, mm -hmm. it's not just, and have acted. 
and it requires a decision to give up security and go out and do to correct what is unjust. Started in the 60s, or actually it continued, but it's still going on today. And it requires a decision to say, well, I'm going to do it, even if they come and take me away, or continue to look at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But it requires a decision to fight. I mean, the very strong tradition of civil disobedience. Yes. And then what Kierkegaard talks about is the subjectivity of freedom. That it is our moral obligation not to obey immoral laws, right? But to make that decision is, um, yes, it's a very dangerous thing. Tough thing, but you're right. Yeah. Okay, I think... Thank you so much. Thank you so much.